Okay, so thank you for, uh, for being here today. Uh, and I'd like to talk about maps and try to explain why it took so long for Erlang to have decent maps. Uh, so first of all, the story. I started Erlang back in 2014, so a few years ago, and Erlang was still R16. And um, it, was, it was nice, it was a new job, new language, I was discovering a whole new world that was totally different from anything I was used to up to that point, uh, programming-wise. And then after a few days, I was like, digging into the uh, documentation for the, standard, for the standard library and looking for, for maps, for data structures to do stuff with. Uh, because when you're designing a web API in anything, it's dealing with JSON, it's like you, you want maps, JSONs are maps. And so I couldn't find anything. I could find dictionaries, uh, but dictionaries, then are great. They don't have good performance. They have logarithmic performance, which is not the constant time operations I, would, I was used to. And even the documentation advised you against using dictionaries for anything too big, or even for anything too small, for that matter, because you're better off with lists if it's small enough. Um, so I was, I was pretty startled by this. So I went to my coworkers and I said, hey, like, what do, you, what, do you guys for, what do you guys use for maps? Like, what, what should I be using? And they were like, yeah, just lists. That's, that's all you got. That's, that's the job you got, to, uh, the tool you got to do the job and, and just go build stuff. That's, that's all you're gonna get. Um, so I was like, okay, that's, that's cool. So I want to build stuff. And, Wait a few months until in uh, April 2014, FTP 17 came out. And um, while I was reading the release notes, I, was, I, I saw in there, oh, they have maps now. They have actual maps. It's a new dictionary data type. And then there was it saying experimental. I was like, OK, that's kind of fishy. Um, so I went to see the code, the bin code, and that's, that's what I found in there. That's the, the code for OTP 17. Uh, and that's the routines to put stuff in a map and then to retrieve it. Uh, and so as you can see, it's really just a list, again, I was stuck with lists. Just really a link, a link list. Which, interestingly, it takes great care to actually keep it ordered. It doesn't use that when it gets an element from it, so I'm not sure what's up with that, but that's really what it was. So it was just back to, you know, lists again. That was, that was a bit not fun. Um, and then a year later, June 2015, OTP 18 came out, and that was, that was the real deal. Um, so they actually had enhanced support for maps, and they were telling us they use HAMTs for that, uh, which you're gonna get back to later. Uh, but seriously, 2018, that's, that's really not great. Like, when you compare it to other languages, uh, Ruby got, so here when I say maps, I mean like any map-like data structures. So that could be hashes in Ruby or dictionaries in Python or whatever. Ruby got them in 1995, so 20 years before Erlang. Uh, same for Java, PHP. Uh, Python got them two years before that, 1993. And if, you, if we don't restrict ourselves to languages that are still in use today, uh, IDBK had maps back in 1977, and MUMPS, which I had not existed before writing this slide, actually existed, uh, had maps in uh, 1966. Um, so maps have been around for like over 50 years. So that really begs the question, what made it so much harder for Erlang to get the same thing that all the guys had? And to, um, to answer the question, uh, we need to take a step back and go look at what pretty much all the other languages uh, use to implement maps. Uh, and so that's hash tables. There's really a lot of way to implement maps out there. But most languages use hash tables because they're really easy to understand, they're really easy to implement, uh, they're robust, and they're, they're efficient. So that, that's really what's being used in, for Python dictionaries, for Ruby hashes, for PHP arrays, and for C++ on, ordered on maps, and, and, and so on and so forth. Just a quick reminder, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with this. Uh, but a hash table is really just an array of pointers. Uh, you start with an empty hash table, just an array of null pointers, uh, and then you want to add a new uh, key value pair in there, say foo bar. Um, so what you do is you just hash the key foo with a hashing function. You get uh, an integer out of that. You take the module of that integer by the length of your array. For example, you get four here, and that tells you, okay, I'm gonna put this um, pair in, the, in position four of my array, and you just end up with a linked list with that node containing your data. And you just repeat the same if you want to insert new uh, data pairs, and you end up with something like this. Uh, and then when you want to uh, look up a given key, you do the exact same. Uh, you apply the same hashing function, hopefully you get the same hash, and so that tells you, okay, if, if this key is in your table, it should be in the linked list written in position four. And so you just go to position, position four, uh, iterate through until you hit either the end of the list or a node that has the same key. In this case, we find the key, and so we know that the value associated is LMN. So that's, um, that's really all we need to know for the concept of this talk about hash tables. 
That's all, all, but that's what all the other languages use, and we want to understand why we can do that with Erlang. Um, so let's imagine that Erlang maps are backed with hash tables too. So very simple Erlang code. We have a first map, a couple of key value pairs, and we just add a new one uh, to form a second map. And so we have something in memory that ends up looking something like this, right? And then the trouble happens when we do this. We want to get the foo key in map one. As we all know, all Erlang variables are immutable, so foo should not be in map one. The problem is the hash table we've been using has no idea who owns what and which key pairs belongs to which Erlang map. And so that is not gonna work. And so the problem here is really to have a data structure that supports what we want, so the four operations that we want in constant time, and at the same time gives the Erlang developer the illusion that everything is immutable. Uh, and to do that, uh, to fake immutability, the Erlang core developers use uh, this data structure called uh, HAMTs. So HAMTs were designed by a researcher named uh, Phil Bagwell, who was a researcher at the um, Federal University in, in Lausanne, Switzerland, and he described HAMTs in two uh, pretty important landmark research papers that you can go read at these URLs. Uh, and as you can see, it's, I mean, it's not super recent, but it's fairly recent compared to when other languages got maps. Um, so, yeah, it would be hard, it would have been hard before that to give maps to our language, or we would have to use something else. So let's try and understand what HAMTs are and how they work. So HAMTs at their core are really just prefix trees. Uh, yeah, prefix trees. So a prefix tree, an empty prefix tree is just a root node with no data in it. And to exemplify how it works, we're just gonna use it to store English words. So we want to, um, to add this um, key value pair to the prefix tree, bare foo. And the way, the way that this works, we just consider one character from the key at a time. So we start from the root, and we look for a subtree corresponding to the letter B, which of course doesn't exist because the tree is empty for now. So we just create uh, a first node, which contains bare foo, and we're done. Cool. Uh, then we want to insert a new pair, bar baz, and same again, we start from the root. We consider the first character in the key, which is a B. Uh, we find the subtree for that key. This time it exists. It's a single node containing the data pair we had, bef uh, we had before. So we just remove the data pair and break apart the node. Um, so we remember we need to save bare foo again later. And starting from this new node, we look for the subtree for the letter A. Of course, it doesn't exist, so same as before we create it, and then we do the same again for bear. And we end up with something like this. Um, so we can repeat that as much as we want, and if we add to the previous tree these three new pairs, we end up with something like this. And how do we search? Same thing. Uh, if we want to look for bar, we start from the root. Um, get the subtree for B, and then from there get the subtree for A, and then from there for R, and we end up there, we've exhausted the key, so we just have to check if there's a value in there. There is, so we found the value, and we're good. Um, basically, the other two cases you can encounter is you get to a leaf, and there's no subtree, but the value in there is actually the key you're looking for, you're good too, and the last case is, oh, you get to a leaf, and there's no subtree for the letter you're looking for, in, the, in which case you know the key is not in the tree. Um, and that's really it for, for prefix trees. That's really how they work. Um, so let's look at how good that is. So in practice, in the Erlang VM, we don't store English words, right? Uh, so the keys the Erlang VM uses are just 32-bit hashes, pretty much the same as for hash tables before. Uh, of the Erlang term used as, used as a key. And it uses not one character, as, you've been, as we've been doing in the example, but it uses five bits of that 32 bits key for each level in the tree. So we know that this tree is gonna be at most seven uh, levels high. Uh, and so we know that whenever we do a, a get or an insert, or same for deletes or, or updates, we're gonna be doing at least eight node operations seven to go down the tree, and then maybe one to break up a, uh, an existing node or, or ro roll back uh, a node that we're delaying. That's cool, we have a really good bound on how many operations we're gonna be doing and how, many, how much time that's gonna take. Um, as far as space goes, it's a little more involved because yeah, if your tree is really not 
nice, you can end up with a lot of nodes uh, to, to the end uh, for end data pairs. But if your hashing function is reasonable, meaning that it actually distributes values pretty evenly over the course, over the, the space image, uh, then Field Bagwell has shown in this paper that uh, you can expect to have a number of nodes that's really close to n. It's n time log log n. Uh, because the idea that the resultant tree, the first nodes, yeah, they're going to have a lot of subtrees. But as you go down, like, it's going to get really parsed really fast. Um, so that's pretty good. Uh, at this point, we have this uh, data structure that seems to be doing what we want in reasonable time, reasonable space. But you notice I put quotes around nodes and nodes operations here, because there's something I conveniently hand waved before when I was saying, oh, we're looking for the subtree corresponding to letter O, right? And I didn't really explain what a node is and how you look up the subtree associated to a letter. And that's really important. It sounds like we need some kind of map here again. We have a key, which is the current character we're considering in the, in the, in the global key. And we want to get the pointer for the next subtree for that, for that key. Um, and so we want this to be fast and not take too much space. So it's pretty reasonable when you get there to be like, OK, um, I have a fixed number of characters. Uh, my alphabet is finite, and I can just have an array that contains all the pointers to all my subtrees. And so your node is just going to contain your value and then that array of pointers. Um, that's fast, because if you, if you ask me, OK, like, can you give me the, song, the pointer to subtree O? I just have to look up the position in the array for letter O and be like, OK, there's, it's a null pointer. There's no subtree. That's very wasteful, because you have an array that's full of null pointers, especially since, again, the tree is sparse. So you expect that thing to be full of null pointers as you go down the trees, and so you waste a lot of space. So next, you're like, OK, I want to keep my space uh, and not, not keep null pointers all over the place. So I'm just going to put my pointers in the linked list. And so I have this linked list now where I have the characters uh, and the pointers to them. So that's good for space, but then search sucks because I have to do a linear search through the linked list when I want to get the, the pointer in the next subtree. So HNT proposed a new way of doing that. And they basically retained the idea, the idea of having an array for quick lookup um, for, 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 for um, to ensure that the search is fast. But instead of, uh, instead of storing pointers in that array, they store bits. It's just a bitmap. And so to know if a given character has a subtree associated to it, you just look up its position in the array. If it's a 0, no subtree. If it's a 1, there is a subtree. And then you want to get the pointer to it. And the way that works is you look at where your <laughs> bit is in the bitmap, and you count how many bits exist to the left of it. And so that gives you the offset at, at which you need to look for in, the, in, the, um, in your array of pointers. And so that's reasonably fast. Uh, all, it needs to, all you need to do is really counting bits, uh, and you don't waste any space. So that's really what makes HAMT as performant as they are. And so at this point, let's look at the code that actually exists in the BMVM today and see how we do lookups in maps today. So it looks something like this. I've modified it a bit, but not too much. Um, so basically, we just compute the, the key, for the, the hash for the key that was given. That was an Erlang term, and that's a 32 bit integer. Um, then we inbox the Erlang map to get a C variable from that, just internals VM stuff. And then it's really what we just did. We started the node of the, uh, at the root of the tree, and we, we, look, uh, we look to see if there's a, a one in the position for the next word. If there's no one, we're done. Uh, if there is a one, we need to count how many bits exist to the left of it, which we do here. Uh, and then we get a pointer to the next node that way. Uh, if the next node happens to be a leaf node, we're done either way, but we just need to know if the key in that node is the key we're looking for. Um, otherwise, we need to continue. So we, net ex we just extract the next word from, um, from the hash, and we continue that way. So once we know how HMTs work and what they are, this code makes sense. OK, so at this point, we have a data structure that seems to be what we want in reasonable time. We understand how it works. Um, but we could have said pretty much the same thing about uh, hash maps earlier, right? The problem with hash maps and the problem we have now, too, is how do this structure actually 
give us the illusion of immutability? How does it allow us to have immutable allowing variables while still being efficient? So let's look at something pretty similar as what we have earlier. Um, we have an Erlang map, we only, which already has three pairs of, uh, of key-value pairs. So that's, that results in a, in a tree that's pretty much that's what we have here. And then we add a new key-value pair in there. We had beat um, bang. And so that's going to result in an HMT that looks like this with the new node in green. But of course, uh, for, that, for these two new nodes to exist, this node also needs to be updated. We need to update its bitmap and its array of pointers. So that means it's, the parent is going to be new, and then the parent is going to be new again, and the root is going to be new too. Um, so each time you do any kind of write operation, if you insert or delete or update something, you need to create new nodes for the path from the root to the node you're modifying. So of course, on this slide, it looks like we're not keeping a lot, right? Because the tree is pretty small. And so of course, we, it looks like we're replacing half of everything. Uh, but if you imagine a more complicated example uh, of a map with a lot of data, and say you want to update this guy there uh, in green, uh, that means you really only need to update this path. And all the rest, you can keep as is. That's much better than what we had before. Um, just a side note on the garbage collector, uh, because that was somewhat interesting. You might be wondering, OK, so we have these nodes all over the place in my memory. And the garbage collector somehow needs to keep track of which nodes are being used by, are still being used by maps when they garbage collect the Erlang maps. And um, I thought that was pretty elegant. It's real, oops, sorry. I was one slide behind. Um, and so the solution they found is really pretty elegant. Uh, each node also has a counter of how many of its parents are alive. And so when you update a path like this, you also need to update all the children of all the new nodes to increment the counters, the counters of alive parents. And so when you garbage collect an Erlang map, you just have to garbage collect the nodes that don't have any parents alive. And um, yeah, that really explained how maps work in Erlang and what they look like, and that's really probably not what you expected your map to look like in memory. Um, so it would be great to actually start doing that for other data structures in Erlang. Uh, it would be great to have action arrays, to have something that behaves like a, a C++ vector or a Java array list, uh, to have double link list, to get the tail of a, uh, of a list in constant time, uh, to have efficient queues, not just the queue module we have from the standard lib. Um, so I don't know how hard it would be to come up with data structures to comply, to actually do these efficient data structures and still have them immutable to an Erlang developer, but that would, be, that would be great, and that would give us the actual tools to do the job properly. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.